The next speaker is Bert O'Neill, who is the head, the head of the GI section, who is going to talk about guiding colorectal cancer therapy. So continuing on the theme of using molecular markers in the clinic, I'm going to talk about some ways we use uh, markers in colorectal cancer. As Tom mentioned, for lung cancer, we're far behind the breast cancer world, but uh, things have gotten more interesting in the last uh, 10 years or so. So uh, basically here I've just categorized the, what I would call clinically useful molecular markers we have into, into their uh, basic uses. Uh, the first and very important is, is genetic counseling. So, you know, we, we, it's important for us to identify families that have uh, inheritable mutations that cause cancer. Um, and I'm actually going to spend quite a bit of time talking in particular about um, mismatch repair deficiency um, during this talk. Uh, BRAF mutation falls into this category as well, although that can also have implications in the metastatic setting. Uh, in, the, in the adjuvant setting, decision making, again, can be dependent upon mismatch repair deficiency, and we'll, we'll talk about that some more. And Lisa spent a little bit of time talking about a, a multi-gene assay for breast cancer, the oncotype assay. There's also a, a similar assay for colon cancer, and I'll talk about some of the uses there. I'm not going to really spend any time talking about metastatic disease, but really our one useful therapy driving marker has been KRAS uh, in, in colon cancer. And there are others uh, that really require more validation, um, some for adjuvant and some for metastatic, and I'm not going to uh, go through the list here. So I'm going to start by talking about mismatch repair because this is going to cover, you know, really it's important for genetics and it's important for potentially for adjuvant therapy decision making. So uh, the process of, dis of mismatch repair. Uh, involves a, a, a number of enzymes, but the basics of it are that if you have a base pair mismatch with normal DNA repair, that mismatched base should be excised and, and, and replaced with the correct base. Uh, if that does not occur, the opposite um, base is replaced with the incorrect um, with the incorrect base, and that is propagated. So. What that results in then, is, is if, if this is occurring throughout the genome, is many mutations. Microsatellite instability confuses people. This is caused by mismatch re repair, but microsatellites are, are not really part of our coding genome. Microsatellites are short repetitive DNA sequences that are subject to duplication via mutation and, this, and are very sensitive to mismatch repair deficiency. Um, the definition, if we're testing a patient for microsatellite instability, is to use a panel of, of DNA markers. Uh, if two to five of those are, are positive or duplicated, that, that patient is considered MSI high, uh, one positive MSI low, and zero positive microsatellite stable. Uh, for all intents, you can consider microsatellite low and microsatellite stable the same. The microsatellite lows don't act like MSI high patients. Having microsatellite instability is part of the definition of HNPCC or Lynch syndrome. This is an inherited uh, disorder where families tend to have a predominance of colon cancer, but also uterine cancers and, and other uh, cancers as well. Um, interestingly, this appears sporadically in 12 to 15 percent of early stage cancers as well. So if you look at all patients who are MSI high with colon cancer, only a small fraction of them are actually going to have Lynch syndrome. The rest of these are a, a sporadic mutation. So, so this is what MSI looks like on a gel. So you see here, you know, a, a set of these microsatellites uh, when run out on a gel in, in tumor, they're duplicated, and you can see several examples of that here. <clears throat> the cause of microsatellite instability is loss of one of several well, mismatch repair genes. And another way that we can assay for this in the clinic is with immunohistochemistry. So here you see two different patients, the top and the bottom. Uh, the patient at the top has expression of MLH1 in the tumor, but no expression of MSH2. So this is MSH2 loss. This patient would expect, would be expected to have microsatellite instability um, and, and vice versa for this patient. Uh, in fact, if you use three markers, these two and, and another one, MSH6, you, you pick up about 95 percent of cases of Lynch syndrome, 
Um, so this is one way to, to easily screen for this in the clinic. <clears throat> the other way to look at this is, is by fluorescence PCR. And, and here you see normal mucosa with five markers. And what, can you, what you see here in a, in a microsatellite stable tumor is no different. In an MSI high tumor, you see that these, these markers are, are, are basically repeated in between. Um, so when we ordered a DNA-based microsatellite instability test, that's, that's what it would look like. Now this is a, really, this is an, an, an important subclass of colon cancer, and this has been confirmed recently by the, the TCGA analysis of colon cancer. Uh, UNC played a major role in, in this effort for colon cancer. Um, what you see here, this is, a, 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 this is the number of mutations seen per million bases uh, in about 225 colon cancers. And you can see there's a pretty distinct difference between what were called non-hypermutated tumors and hypermutated tumors, where the rates of mutation were, were drastically increased. And if you look at MSI, high, MSI status, uh, a red line is a patient who is MSI high. And what you see is that the, the majority of the hypermutated tumors are MSI high. Uh, this correlates with what's called a um, CPG island methylator phenotype. So they're, they're methylated and they have silencing of MLH1, one of the mismatch repair genes. And in terms of genetic counseling, this is, a, this is a, uh, an algorithm we go through in the clinic. When we see a patient with co colon cancer, uh, we're testing for, for microsatellite instability. That can be either the DNA-based test or the uh, immunohistochemistry. At least, at least one should be done. If it appears to be MSI high, then you can look at methylation status. If there is MLH1 hypermethylation, you can stop genetic counseling because this is a sporadic tumor. This does not happen in Lynch syndrome patients. If there's no methylation, then you go back and test a normal tissue such as blood. If you find microsatellite instability in normal tissue, then on to test other family members because you've identified someone with germline uh, microsatellite instability. <clears throat> now the other use of this besides genetic counseling has to do with both prognostication and potentially prediction of, of th type of therapy that should be used. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of studies looking at outcome in early stage colon cancer uh, based on uh, MSI high status. And what you see is that in all of these studies, essentially, with a few exceptions, uh, patients who were MSI high did better. And here you see the, the point estimate being about 40 percent better than patients with microsatellite stable tumors. So how, what does this mean to us in the clinic? Well, the, the place this has become most useful to us is one where there is a, a still a lot of uncertainty, and that's the use of chemotherapy in stage 2 colon cancer. Uh, this is an, an older meta-analysis of patients with stage 2 colon cancer with trials of 5-fluorouracil-based of therapy or, or no therapy after surgery, uh, where you can see that the hazard ratio is 0.3, p-value is 0.57, suggesting there is no clear benefit to 5-fluorouracil-based chemotherapy. The largest single trial looking at this question was called the Quasar study. This is a, a UK study uh, where patients got postoperative 5-FU or, or observation. Uh, it showed a real but, but quite small 5-year uh, overall survival benefit of about 3.6 percent. Uh, given that our colorectal cancer patients tend to be older, this, this causes a dilemma in the clinic. You have to treat 100 patients to, to cure four here, and many patients don't want to have six months of chemotherapy without having a better sense for how much it will help them. It's very hard for a patient to kind of wrap their head around, you know, my, my chance of being cured is 4% better if I do chemotherapy or not. Um, <clears throat> so one way um, that MSI testing has helped us here uh, is, is by looking at is there an interaction between MSI status and uh, chemotherapy benefit. And the best study of this, and, and probably the best data we'll ever have on this, is, uh, comes from the Mayo Group and Dan Sargent. Uh, this, they, they looked at tumor samples that were available from a number of older trials. They had to be older trials because they had to be 5-FU versus no therapy trials that don't exist anymore. And <clears throat> they assayed for mismatch repair deficiency. About 15 percent of all the patients in this analysis were, were mismatch repair deficient. 
And the really interesting finding, so in, in, in all of these cases, uh, the blue lines are going to be 5-FU-based chemotherapy and yellow is going to be no therapy. Uh, for stage 3 patients who are microsatellite stable, you see a, a, a very nice benefit from chemotherapy. For stage 2 patients, it's minimal. For stage 3 MSI high, the, the numbers are relatively small, but there, you know, there still appears to be at least some benefit from chemotherapy. But when you look at the stage 2 MSI high patients, the curves actually have flipped over. So patients actually did better if they got no therapy than if they got chemotherapy. Now, some of this may have to do with how 5-FU was given in the past. It's typically was given in ways that are more toxic than ways we deliver it uh, in, in the current era. Uh, but really what this study told us is that it's, it's hard to see a benefit of giving chemotherapy to someone with a, an early stage MSI high tumor. So this is, this is clinically useful, involves 15% of the patients. What about the other 85%? We still have this dilemma of should they get chemotherapy or not with a small benefit? And, and that's where multi-gene testing has, has come into play. So I'll talk mostly about the Oncotype uh, score because it's the most widely used, although there are, other, there are others uh, that have been developed, such as Coloprint. Um, this is a 12-gene 12, a 12 signature with five reference genes. Um, it was validated in the Quasar study that I just mentioned. So this, the, it was developed out of other data sets validated in the Quasar study. And if you look at the stage two patients and their three year or their, their risk of recurrence, um, when patients are divided into low, intermediate, and high based on their score, you see there is separation, um, although not as large a separation as, as you see in the, in the breast cancer tests. Um, can this be useful? Well, if, if it's going to make a difference to a patient, if their risk is 22% versus 12% in terms of chemotherapy decision, then yes, this is a useful test. Uh, if that's not going to help the patient, then it may not be so useful. So it's something that needs to be discussed with the patient before the test is ordered. Uh, unfortunately, the test does not predict whether the patient will benefit from chemotherapy, so one has to assume proportional benefit, meaning you have to assume that if they have a low risk, they're going to have a low benefit. If they're going to have a high risk, they have a higher benefit, but that's... That's an assumption. So that's interesting. I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's useful in some patients. Um, what was perhaps more interesting with this test was, was presented at ASCO this year, and this was the NSABP group that looked at the recurrence score in one of their studies, CO7. CO7 looked at uh, adding oxaliplatin to 5-FU leucovorin in patients with stages 2 and 3 colon cancer. Importantly, uh, oxaliplatin does improve survival in stage 3 patients, not, not so much in stage 2 patients. And the decision to give oxaliplatin has meaning because it, patients will occasionally have long-term neuropathy after treatment with oxaliplatin. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a given that, that all patients should get it. Um, but the benefit is large enough in stage 3 um, that we typically offer oxaliplatin. So <clears throat> when looking at the CO7 uh, data set, and you'll see here that uh, each, each solid line is going to be the oxaliplatin arm, each, each dashed line is going to be the, the 5-FU alone treated patients, that the so-called dynamic range of the test is actually quite, quite a bit larger in the stage 3 patients than it was in the stage 2. And in fact, there's a, a large amount of overlap for the stage 3AB patients with the stage 2 patients in, in terms of their risk of recurrence. So the question this raises then is, if a patient has a score that puts them down in this range, are they, are they really benefiting from oxaliplatin? The proportional benefit would, is, is only about 20 to 25 percent, so the, the absolute benefit at that point becomes quite small if their risk of recurrence is only in the 10 to 15 percent range. How does that look in, in a Kaplan-Meier curve? Well, well, as I showed before, dividing the patients into a low, intermediate, and high risk score group, and, and again, looking at the dashed lines here are the oxaliplatin arms. For the low risk group, there does not appear to be any benefit from, from oxaliplatin. For the high risk group, the, the benefit seems to be quite robust. Interestingly, even for stage 3C patients, so now you're talking about patients with, with more than four lymph nodes positive, a, a higher risk group, <clears throat> if you look at the low risk score group, again, there's essentially no benefit from oxaliplatin. 
So it appears as though this test, which was developed as a test to look at recurrence in colon cancer in general, somehow appears to be predictive of response or, or benefit from oxaliplatin. Uh, you know, and this is something we've actually just started to use in the clinic to some extent, particularly in, in older patients or patients with diabetes, patients we, you know, would, may not want to give oxaliplatin because of excess risk of toxicity or, or, or neuropathy. <clears throat> so I'll finish up just with a little more from the TCGA because it's, since it was just published, it's, uh, this will kind of drive our development of markers in the future. Um, here you see the non-hypermutated tumors and the hypermutated tumors and the, and the mutation seen. The, obviously, higher overall numbers of uh, mutated cases in the hypermutated tumor, so that each, each tumor would be expected to have multiple mutations here. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't see a, a home run like an ALK. There's not a clearly targetable um, tyrosine kinase in here in the com among the common mutations. Uh, what was a theme and, and is really already sort of known is that you know, mismatch repair issues dominate the hypermutated tumors, as I already mentioned. Uh, the Wnt pathway is, is quite dominant in colon cancer. So 80% of non-hypermutated colon colorectal tumors have a mutation in APC. This is loss. This is, at this point, not a targetable type of mutation, unfortunately. Uh, all the ways of targeting the, the Wnt beta catenin pathway are being developed. Uh, and, and the other that seemed fairly prominent are, are, are issues within the, the TGF beta pathway. So hopefully this will form our next generation of, of both targets and markers in the clinic uh, in, the, in the coming years. So with that, I'll uh, stop and leave you with this thought. I think, uh, I think this, I have this gene definitely. Um, <laughs> I also have the, this one, the delusions of stock market savvy. So, all right. <laughs> Thank you.